Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Laudato Jesus Christus, in Sequela, this is Timothy Flanders, the Beanie of Catholic. Jesus is King. I'm very happy to be joined by my friend, Dr. Scott Hahn. Dr. Hahn, it's always a pleasure and an honor. It's great to be with you, not only in person, but in your home. Uh, this studio is just uh, set within a, a context I wish our viewers could enjoy as much as I have. I just flew into Atlanta, just flew from Atlanta into Grand Rapids, and you picked me up at the airport. And uh, I'm eager for this conversation. Yeah, so uh, Scott Hahn has just released his latest text, which is Catholics in Exile. Here it is right here. And so before we talk about that, uh, so what's new at the St. Paul Center? What's going on? Well, something massive, and that is our new headquarters. We'll be moving into it next week. 25,000 square feet, two acres, right across from the entrance to the university. And we've really solidified our partnership with Franciscan University. They bought the land, I think for 1.2 million, they sold it to us for half off. And then they reduced it even more, I think, to cement that kind of affiliation that is more than just an official status. It really is, we're joined at the heart. And so uh, we're eager to do things together. We're also doing so many other things that are you know, quite our own. Uh, next month, we'll have about 200 priests in California for a, it's not quite a week, about a five-day priest conference. It's the first of three that we hold annually. Somewhere around 600 priests will basically soak in sacred scripture for all of those days to learn how to read it in the, you know, read it from the heart of the church, read it like the early church fathers, but at the same time, read it in a way that is distinct from what they probably learned in seminary. Excellent. That's fantastic. Yeah. I'm so excited about the work of St. Paul Center. So, oh, thank and you. the headquarters coming out. Um, I, I had a question from one of our guild community, Sam. He was asking about the kids' lamb supper that was just released recently, I think. Tell us yeah. about that. In fact, kids' I have version. A copy here. Oh, great. Okay. I'm going to be giving this copy to my nephew, oh. Ravi. Uh, and for his kids, it's The Supper of the Lamb by Scott Hahn and Emily Stimson Chapman. It came out right around the same time as Catholics in Exile, but for quite a different audience. Unless, of course, you have kiddos, you know. And we've got six kids, but they're all adult. We now have 22 grandkids. And so I have shifted in my own literary energies uh, to work with Emily Stimson Chapman and also Trisha Dugat, who is this amazing illustrator. So how do you take... The Lamb Supper, the Mass is Heaven on Earth, which has been out now for over 20 years, and break it down for grandkids. Well, I thought we might be able to do it. Emily it pulled it off. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. And the poetry and the artistry, as well as the storyline, uh, make it such that um, you basically get a sense that when you go to Mass, you're going to heaven that the angels and the saints and the songs and the prayers and the sacrifice of the Lamb and Our Lady, all of these things that I wrote into the script of Lamb's Supper Excellent. is broken down poetically. Now, Tessa, before I got a chance to even read it to my granddaughter, she just read it and reread it. And it's like, I'm not sure which is better, me reading it to her, that's better for me, but her reading it on her own again and again, and a lot of the other grandkids have been also enjoying it too. That is fantastic. It's we were just talking in the car about childlikeness and, and reading to the your kids, the just catechizing your children at a very young age. I, I'm really excited to share that with my own kids. So, oh, thank you. I for wish I brought a out. second copy. I'll send you one. Well, excellent, excellent. I I, I thank my kids. Thank you for that. So, uh, this conversation is a part of our lay apostolate series, and in particular, it's for our guild community that we're doing the annual Bible in a Year Challenge, which is where you read the whole Bible in terms of the liturgical tradition, what what the traditional office of Matins has given us uh, traditionally. So traditionally in Advent, we would read Isaiah. And then during Epiphany Tide, we'll read the Epistles of St. Paul. We'll also start uh, St. Mark's Gospel as well. And your text, like all your texts, Dr. Han, are really just a cornucopia, a feast of Scripture, and this, 
this text really brings in something very um, powerful, but a very consistent theme in Scripture that is less discussed, but very important. Uh, but before we kind of get into that text, uh, <laughs> this is your second one with McGinley. Right. And uh, shout out to Brandon. We couldn't have, Brandon wasn't wasn't uh, available to be with us today, but this is your second text with McGinley. So how does, how does Catholic in Exiles work with the first one, It Is Right and Just? Well, they're inseparable. I mean, the bond between the two is such that, you know, clearly in, chrono- in chronological terms, Catholics in Exile is the sequel. But it's sort of like a chicken or egg type of thing. Which one should you read first? It doesn't matter. Uh, there is no sense in which you won't understand something in Catholics in Exile because you haven't read It Is Right and Just. But we have formed a friendship, a partnership, and a conversation that has been going on for years. He's quite busy now in Pittsburgh publishing, you know, the Post Gazette, the paper I used to deliver when I was a boy, as well as in sort of the uh, the political climate there as well. And so I'm excited for Brandon, but I'm especially excited because the fruit of our friendship began, you know, back in 2020 when It Is Right and Just came out, subtitled Why the Future of Civilization Depends Upon Religion, True Religion. And, you know, a lot of people misunderstood this to be a, like a, a primer to integralism. And it is not in any way opposed to integralism, but it's not a kind of contemporaneous statement of politics. It really is taking the lines from the liturgy that people have grown up with. It is right and just. It is our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere. We say it, do we mean it? Do we understand it? Probably not. It is right and just, just and dignum est, you know, implies that it would be profoundly wrong and unjust. In fact, to not give God thanks and praise, not only privately and individually, but publicly and socially, is a massive injustice. More than a misdemeanor, more than a felony. It's really a crime against the divinity. And yet it's now just sort of the air we breathe, not even recognizing the toxicity of it. And so what we do, you know, we in that book, It Is Right and Just, and we've discussed this in the past, we, we look at, you know, Jim Marshall and the wrong way run when he thought he scored a touchdown he ran the wrong way I think a lot of Catholics are running the wrong way they don't know how to think in terms of okay the word of God my own state of life and my own cultural setting what do I do well do I just privatize and hide this do I relativize morality like the social order insists of course not Okay, so what baby steps can we take? Well, most of them will take place in our marriage, our family, and our extended family, and then with friends, with parishioners, and that sort of thing. You know, but at the end of the book, it gave people great hope. It got, it got them excited. But invariably, what Brandon and I would hear was, this is wonderful, but we're never going to see this. What do we do in the meantime? And I was talking about this, you know, that we're not just planting the fall crop so we have food for the winter. We're really planting a kind of forest that we might not live long enough to see grow up so that our grandkids, our great-grandkids will have the lumber to build their houses, their furniture, and so on. This is a long-term investment. Now, Catholics in exile is that as well, but even more, it's sort of like, how do we think about the situation that we find ourselves in Because, I mean, a lot of people are prone to anger, anxiety, depression, sadness. When you look at the moral chaos in the the society, when you look at the confusion and the corruption, even within the church today, you know, not just in one particular diocese or another, but it seems to just seep in everywhere. And so to give in to anger, gossip, detraction, all of these things that are so understandable, but they're extraordinarily counterproductive and dangerous to our soul, to our families as well. So what we have to recognize on the one side is how highly unoriginal our circumstances are, that the people of God have invariably found themselves as pilgrims, as sojourners, in exile. I mean, beginning with our first parents when they were driven out of the Garden of Eden. And I mean, you could just trace the narrative of salvation history, which unfortunately many people don't know. And so if they're reading through scripture, they're beginning to get a sense that what happens to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and not just the patriarchs, but after Moses and Joshua in the period of the judges, you know, it's like their exile is a spiritual condition that we always find ourselves in. But even then, you know, if we look at the golden age of Israel under David and Solomon, it wasn't even 80 years long. 
But if we went up to Zion, singing the Psalms of Ascent, and we entered the court of the, the temple, we would be just so grateful, so filled with joy and praise. But David, if he were with us, would lean over and whisper, we're still in exile. We're not home yet. The idea of heaven being sort of imposed by New Testament believers upon the Old Testament Israelites. No, you know, the the faith that they had in Christ, as Paul insists throughout his writings, is the same faith that we have. They believe in the coming of the Christ. We believe that the Christ has come and will return. So what difference does that make? That even when they were in the Garden of Eden, that was a place of testing. That was not our first parents' final destination. And it's so easy to get trapped into this. You know, on the other hand, you have to be aware of the danger of being so heavenly minded that you just basically check out of the responsibilities of life. Paul says it well, Philippians 3.20, you know, our citizenship is in heaven, he tells the Philippians, but he doesn't say, so therefore just allow Philippian culture to go to hell. No, of course not. We've got dual citizenship, but they're not equal. So practically speaking, what we focus on besides Hebrews 11, looking at how the patriarchs and the prophets all knew that they were sojourners on earth, destined for heaven, in a city not made with hands, and a temple that is not just man-made too. And this is already evident in the prophets, in the intertestamental literature, you know, and so I, I, without getting into Shalmaneser or Tig, Tiglath-Pileser, the the third, or without getting into the Assyrians, the Babylonian, all of the historical figures of Israelite exile, which was protracted. It was a lot longer than we realize. You know, if we were to wake up and find out that the diocese, you know, the chancery was bombed, or that St. Peter's Basilica was struck by terrorists is now in ruins, we would enter into a period of crisis, a crisis of faith. But Jerusalem, the temple, the priesthood, the feasts, the pilgrimages, all of that, gone for not just 70 years, but then it's 70 times seven years. Say what? God, are you asleep at the wheel? Have you checked out to look into other galaxies? What? And, and then you realize that this is not like a God who wants to be sovereign but isn't. It is a God revealing mysteries to his people to the present day. So that in 2023, in 2024, the recognition that we're not home yet, that if God is our father, we're a family, but if he's in heaven as we pray in every our father, then we're in exile, we're pilgrims, we're sojourners. And what practical differences can we, well, we draw from Jeremiah 29, we call it the Jeremiah option. He gives to the first exiles shipped off from Jerusalem to Babylon, seven steps. You know, practical things. First of all, build houses and live in them. You know, and I think the Jewish exiles would have been like, don't you mean rent apartments, pitch tents, you know, uh, build houses? You know, it's going to be a permanent thing? Yeah, and live in them. Okay, what else? Plant gardens and enjoy their produce. What does that mean? Well, it means get to work. Get your hands dirty. Get the dirt in your fingernails and enjoy the produce Okay, what else? Have sons and daughters. Be given in marriage and have your sons and daughters. Fourth is give your sons in marriage and your daughters as well. So think in terms of a future orientation. I don't mean to go on so long, but I mean, whenever I have finished a book, it is so deeply embedded in my system. You poke me at 3 a.m. and I'll pour several chapters. (laughs) But there are seven steps, and the seventh one is the most important one, and that is prayer. Mm -hmm. But not just prayer for yourself and your own family, but prayer for the shalom, the welfare of the city to which the Lord your God has driven you. You So the idea of being fruitful, multiplying, and filling the earth wasn't rescinded. It wasn't suspended. It was, in fact, God's purpose for Israel, not to be like the other nations and just kind of protecting their own land, making Israel great again, you know, and just seeing the economy flourish. No, there ought to be a holy nation, a kingdom of priests, and that's what's transferred, according to St. Peter, to the church now as well. Excellent. Well, so it is right and just. You can buy that at the link below. Um, I want to just quote from uh, page 61 here, All right. um, where you say this. While Christians' current political situation is an aberration 
from centuries of Christendom, it is hardly unknown in church history. As Peter's epistles attest, leaders and observers of the early church were keenly aware of Christians' tenuous circumstances in the Roman Empire. So you, you kind of uh, talked about this a little bit, but can you summarize what is a theology of exile, and is that essential to Christianity? It is essential. And so even when we succeed in forming a Catholic culture, a Christian civilization, even when we look at 12th and 13th century Christendom under Innocent III with Dominic and Francis, or you know, at the time of Aquinas and Bonaventure teaching at the University of Paris, the greatest university education you could have ever gotten in all of history, you know, they all would have said the same thing, that exile is their current condition. And so if we have set our hearts on heaven as our only final destination, as our only true happiness for ourselves and our loved ones, then there's a certain freedom, a, a kind of liberation that comes to us. We become not bound to fear, but in a certain way, we become fearless because we've got nothing to lose here. And so we're not going to be able to take it with us anyway. So let's just use what we've got in terms of time, money, energy, and make visible signs in our homes, in our schools, and in all of the other buildings that represent the kind of culture that reflects our values that are all going to function in a way like signs that point ourselves and everybody else to the thing, the only thing for which we were made, and that is heaven. And so the idea of the mass as being heaven on earth, which was the theme of the Lamb's Supper, a number of my readers, a number of our readers have picked up the narrative arc that you can trace from the Lamb's Supper, the mass is heaven on earth, that you don't, we all want to go to heaven, but we don't have to die as Catholics to go to heaven. We all, we go to mass and the divine liturgy is lifting us up. We lift up our hearts. The new Jerusalem is descending to earth in the power of the spirit. And if that's the case, okay, then when we go, when we leave as missionaries, Ita Misa Est, we want to go forth and basically live out the fruits of Holy Communion, live out the, the, the what Christ has merited through his holy sacrifice in the Mass. And so whether it's sports, culture, you know, enjoyment, or health, education, hospitals, well, you know, all of these things, we just want to put a Christian stamp on it, not by being like fundamentalist Protestants who just stand on the street corner and are in your face, but no, less is more. And so like the leaven that pervades the loaf and causes it to rise, I think that is the presence that we have in exile, the same way the Jews set into motion there in Babylon something that they did not ever anticipate. I mean, when you read the opening chapters of Daniel, you realize that through the faithful witness of Daniel and his friends, they reach into the heart of Nebuchadnezzar. He undergoes a kind of conversion. He's professing the God of Israel to be the God of gods. He lapses, as most politicians do, but then he has a second conversion like most of us need as well. And so you, you just entrust all of this into the providential hands of the Lord God Almighty and just be faithful and fearless and then stand back and see what he does with it. Now, one of the things that scholars will often say is that the Jews at the time of Christ were looking for this sort of earthly Messiah to restore the kingdom of Israel. And um, one question I have is, how do you see this ex the spirituality of exile from heaven specifically in the Torah? Because the narrative is so much about claiming the promised land, and so the goal seems very earthly. So how do you see this exile from heaven in the Torah? Dang, these are good questions that require more time, so I'll try to, I'll try to answer them briefly. Okay, so first of all, you know, according to the rabbinic count, there are 613 statutes in the Torah of Moses. And so when they ask Jesus, which is the greatest, just he knows exactly which one it is. It's Deuteronomy 6, 5, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is like unto it, Leviticus nineteen eighteen. Many Christians don't even realize he's quoting Leviticus of all books. Mm. Love your neighbor as yourself. So not all the commandments are created equal. Love of God is first, love of neighbor is second, and they're not interchangeable. One is immeasurably higher, and it's the source of the other. So you love your neighbor as yourself for the love of God. 
And then you got 611 other statutes. But when you look carefully, even in Exodus, before you get to Leviticus, you see this whopping disproportion. It's like, why are most of the laws in Exodus about the liturgy, the sacrifice, the altar, the tabernacle, the priestly vestments, the feasts, and all of the preparation that goes into the Ark of the Covenant. It's like, we're wasting papyrus here. Come on, let's get on with economics and politics. And you're barely looking at 15% of the Mosaic law. Why is that? Well, you know, Egyptian bother just kind of, you know, disorients you. No, not at all. It really is, as we point out, that the Exodus was brought about not only by the nine plagues, but the tenth one. The ninth, the nine plagues, God is basically showing his supremacy over the entire Egyptian pantheon. But the tenth one actually required obedience on the part of Israel in celebrating the Passover for the first time. That's a liturgy. And so through liturgy comes liberation. And not only are you to revere God and love him with your heart, but you as families too. And so when you come out and meet at Mount Sinai, it isn't like, well, we've moved from the liturgy to the constitutional convention. No, even that is all about sacrifice, priesthood, holiness, preparing ourselves for three days for the coming of the Lord. You know, but there's still a difference there because they haven't been purged, they haven't been cleansed. And so you'll see that the trajectory from Sinai to Zion takes centuries. The tabernacle is the center for worship. The temple is the center for worship. There is no mention of any songs being sung, no music, total silence at Sinai. But then the temple in Zion, Jerusalem, this is the point of the conquest. But as I mentioned, even still we're in exile, but the temple represents heaven and earth. David reorganizes the Levites. It's perpetual adoration, uh, 24-7. And the people are learning something like, you know, in anticipation of Jesus, it really is the most important commandment. And so this is not something that the New Testament writers foist upon the worldliness of the Israelites. No, most Israelites were worldly, like most Catholics are worldly. So it isn't like an anti-Semitic undertow here. No, not at all. The vast majority of the people in Jesus' day who read the Law and the Prophets seem to have expected a kingdom that was worldly. Well, I think the vast majority of Catholics in the 21st century living in America and throughout Europe or the West generally think the same way. We're going to assess our popes, our bishops, our priests, our teachers and theologians on the basis of how they can contribute to the things that we want the most. Well, if you want the love of God and the love of neighbor and holiness, then you're gonna be able to find the leaders and the teachers you need. But if you don't want those things, like so many people don't, really want those things, I think we're going to be able to understand why were there messianic expectations back then that seemed to be so worldly? Oh, they were the Jews. Well, you know, they're the firstborn son. The younger Gentile nations are like siblings that follow the same pattern, you know. And so I, I, I would say what we need to do is continually convert and recalibrate our own measurement, you know, so that we realize how hard it is to wake up every day and to set our hearts and minds and hopes on heaven and then actually live in such a way. And the second half of the book emphasizes what Jeremiah told the exiles, plant gardens, enjoy the fruit, work hard, get your hands dirty because hard labor is not the curse for sin. Hard labor is the instrument of salvation and sanctification from sin. The curse is unfruitful labor you know, the thorns and the thistles and the sweat and all of the rest. But fruitful labor is in so many deep ways. We cite Cardinal Wyszynski, you know, who was spirit, the spiritual father for John Paul II and really for the whole country of Poland um, and under the Nazis, then the Soviets in prison for years. And yet he is working like a dog and he's teaching them to work and pray. Ora et labora is sort of inhaling and exhaling. And it's the way that families can actually retain the faith and actually grow from one generation to the next. As you were saying that, I was just thinking about the Holy Spirit in the creation in Genesis 1 and the tree of life and then the glory cloud and the glory descending as, as sort of a centerpiece of the Pentateuch because they're going to the promised land in order to establish a place for my name where the glory cloud can be there and the union of heaven and earth. And at, at, 
it just exploded to me as you were saying that. I love that. Let, let me ask you another question. I'm glad different, you different I'm note. Yes. Different note. Uh, page fifty nine. You mentioned the Vatican II. Uh, the Second Vatican Council is perhaps the key moment in the shift in the Church's self-understanding from the creator and protector of Christendom to a scattered leaven in a secular world. So would you say that Vatican II is the Council of Exile? I would say Vatican I and Vatican II are the Councils of Exile. Prior to 1870, the Catholic Church in general, the Magisterium, you know, the the Curia in the Vatican could count on Catholic rulers to basically implement the teachings of the church with regard to doctrine and morals. Uh, not perfectly, radically flawed, in fact, down through the ages. But when you look at 1789, the period for the French Revolution, you know, you, you have the eldest daughter of the church turning on the mother. But even before that, you have in the Reformation. So in the early 16th century, not just Luther in Germany and Calvary, Calvin in Geneva, Switzerland, but across most of Northern Europe, you have Protestantism turning on Mother Church and the spiritual father of the Pope. You know, in my own lectures and my courses, I trace this back to Machiavelli. I trace this back to Occam. I trace this back to Marsilius of Padua to show that, I mean, already in the 1300s, you have the seeds that are sown that become these weeds that choke off the fruit of Christendom. Uh, and so Vatican I can no longer count on Christian Catholic rulers to implement these things. And so the infallibility of the Pope, in a certain sense, becomes necessary and fitting precisely because who else can Catholics turn to now that all of their rulers have basically turned their back on the faith? Vatican II, I would say, is the full flowering of this, uh, you know, because you have more bishops at Vatican II from the third world, outside of what Europe had been as Christendom. You know, uh, and so uh, I, I want to be careful here because I think what you find at Dignitatis Humanae, at least what I found when I first read it as a Protestant, is the traditional teaching of the church, which is renewed in the catechism, that not just human individuals, not just families, but societies, rulers have an obligation to render worship to God in truth, not just kind of following their own way. And so while we respect consciences, we recognize that just following your conscience is not enough. You've got to form your conscience according to the infallible truth of the Catholic faith because the holy sacrifice of the Mass is the most perfect and proper form of worship for citizens and societies. And so you can find that in Vatican II, but you can't find that in the world today and so I suspect that the Holy Spirit had a purpose in giving people the pastoral counsel that they would need in order to live in societies now that are not only post-Christian, but profoundly anti-Christian. You mentioned um, Stefan Vajinsky. Uh, that was a great uh, part of the book. I really loved um, But in the time we have left, I wanted to ask you about um, – part later on in the book where you talk you mention in passing the liturgical debates and and as we all should you lament that it's sort of a, a locus of rancor and what would you like to uh can you summarize some of the things you said in the book about what would you like to inject into that liturgical debate to bring it towards some positive fruit well, I mean, I have an aversion to liturgical politics, but I have an attraction to the traditional Latin Mass. And I, I, I don't hide it, but I also don't put it on parade. And Brandon, oh, I hope I'm not telling tales out of school. I mean, he's at most precious blood. He, he drives his family a little bit, a little longer. And the place is just exploding with young families with lots of kids and reverence, too. That's the yeah. FSSP parish. That's in right, Pittsburgh. in Pittsburgh. Yeah. You know, and our parish... Uh, St. Peter's downtown Steubenville has the traditional Latin Mass with Father Tim every Sunday at noon. And invariably, I'm drawn to that. Not because I just feel so at home. I mean, the Novus Ordo is more like home to me. You know, like marriage is so much more natural to me. But that doesn't mean holy orders is inferior or even on the same level. Holy matrimony, holy orders, they really, one hand washes the other. I would say that the Novus Ordo, done well, I mean, it's, it's a valid mass, and so it brings heaven to earth. 
And so I just don't wade into those waters much anymore because I just don't find it to be productive, especially at this time. And so as long as we have that sort of freedom, let's be honest and acknowledge the fact that the reverence, the transcendence, the beauty, even if it does feel at times somewhat alien to our own cultural conditioning, nevertheless, it points us to something that shows us that what we have in the visions of John and the Apocalypse are visions of heavenly worship that leave, I mean, John falls on his face as though dead. And Jesus doesn't say, come on, John, you're my beloved disciple, get up. Fear not, you know. There is a sense in which their healthy awe, reverence, and fear makes us want to plant our faces before the Almighty God. I could go on, but let me let me just say this, that either way, you know, the, the Western right in both forms has this capacity that is still largely untapped. In fact, I think it's unrecognized. The Catholic faith in general and the, the holy sacrifice of the Mass in particular has a power to form civilizations the likes of which no other religion can boast. It just can, and it has. The second thought, though, is this, that the primary purpose of the Catholic faith and the holy sacrifice of the Mass is not to form Catholic civilizations. It's to form saints. And so if we seek first the kingdom of heaven, these things might be added, but invariably we start seeking these things instead, and we also check off that box, you know. But you can't have the tail wag the dog, and so this is what causes things to crumble. But because the, the Catholic faith and the holy sacrifice of the mass can form saints, and really nothing else can or does, you can also sense why it is that the Catholic Church and the sacrifice of the Mass forms opposition, forms persecution, forms misunderstanding. But even sometimes when our enemies do understand our belief system, they still despise it because it's so demanding. The logic of the love of the Holy Trinity, downloaded through the Incarnation into the Paschal Mystery, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, it's the only logic that holds together all of the law of Christ. Once people figure out that they can't put filters and they can't select, like, this is what I'm going to obey and that is what I like, those other things are sort of like options. Once you figure that out, you're in deep trouble. And so I would say that the Catholic Church and the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, at the end of the day, is here to form saints. But saints ought to work to form civilizations because Catholic civilization makes it easier for more people to become saints. Let's face it, but can God still, you know, the arm of the Lord is not shortened that he cannot save. He can save the Thomas Christians in India who never succeeded in creating a kind of sacramental society like we said we have seen in the West. And so we we can't give in to anger, depression. We can't give in to nostalgia either and just say, oh, if it was only like it was before the council or before the French Revolution or before the Protestant Reformation, you know. We're, we're still in the midst of salvation history, but that means we're still in the midst of spiritual warfare. That reminds me of uh, what Brandon McGinley says in his, his book, Prodigal Church. He talks Love about how book. the 50s are a, a time of great church attendance where the family life is devoid of prayer, is what he right. says. It's like we're just checking out the box. And the seminaries um, were full and the right, convents right. as well, but it was really a kind of cool thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, if there wasn't that sort of inner death... Or, or brittle um, brittleness. What? Why did? Why did it happen? Why did it happen the way that it happened after right. the council? Um, but in, you, what you're really saying, and I, what I like about the book is that you, we are sort of entering into the true Christendom at the Mass. We're entering true. into the heavenly Jerusalem, which is, which is why that can still form saints even if it's in exile. Uh, if we're in a time of that. Um, one, one, I have a question from another guild member, Timothy, and he mentions the keeping of the, of Sunday, the keeping of the Lord's Day, also something that occurred to her, his family, and as many of us did, during COVID, when there was a lockdown, we couldn't go to Mass. So the question is, what is the importance of keeping the Lord's Day? How do we keep the Lord's Day holy, especially if we can't go to Mass? Right. What's the importance in exile? Well, you know, I mentioned earlier that when Jeremiah writes that letter to the exiles in chapter 29, the seventh principle is prayer. And that too is not just personal and private. It's also as public as it can be. 
And it, it didn't allow to go to the temple for the feasts where the priest would offer the sacrifice and you'd bring your tithes. You might only be able to light a Sabbath candle. You might only be able to gather your family around that. You might you know, have a copy of the Psalms. You might not. You might only be able to pray and sing certain ones from memory. But the point is, whatever you can do is what you must do personally and as a family and as a neighborhood, as a network and that sort of thing. Synagogue, the term isn't found anywhere in the Law and the Prophets. Rabbi isn't found anywhere in the Law and the Prophets. Why? Because they're not mandated by the Law of God, but they emerge as a result of exile. So synagogues become sort of places where you assemble to worship as much as you can far from Jerusalem without the Levites offering the sacrifices, etc. And I, I think there's something healthy about recognizing the value of the synagogue, the rabbi, the scroll, the sermon, the assembly that meets afterwards to figure out, okay, how do we put this into practice as much as we can under these adverse circumstances? But ultimately, what we have as Catholics is not either or. It's both you know, inheriting the synagogue, the liturgy of the word, the synaxis, the assembly, but also, above all, it's the holy sacrifice of the mass. Because we do have a temple. We have a high priest. We've got an altar. We've got a sacrifice. So we've got the pilgrimage. And so in as much as it's possible for us to make the holy sacrifice of the mass central, we can and we should. Eucharistic adoration as well. We know that generations of the faithful can survive in Asia apart from priests and the sacraments, but that's no excuse for us to absent ourselves from the things that we and our children and our grandkids need. And so whatever you can do, you must do. I, I also want to just kind of, it's sort of like a, a sidebar for a moment because I think this will help us to understand, you know, Protestant worship that I came from was deliberately, consciously patterned after Jewish worship in exilic conditions. That is, synagogue, rabbi, scroll, sermon. It's not found anywhere at Sinai or Zion. And so the idea of Protestant liturgy involving what? Well, you've got a pastor-centered church. You've got the Bible. You've got the sermon. That's the main event. I can understand why we did it that way. But, you know, even Rabbi Baruch Levine in his Leviticus commentary points out that the idea of divine presence and sacred space is embedded in the Law and the Prophets. And it's not in Jewish synagogue liturgy. It's not in Protestantism either. You know, and, and, and kind of a, a flash of insight that is utterly unexpected. He says, if you want to go where there's a divine presence, sacred space, and sacrifice, you have to go down the street to your Catholic parent. He's not encouraging Jews to become Catholic. He's just making an empirical observation that most Catholics miss, that we really do have this convergence of the exilic condition where we hear the word, we long for home, and then we're taken up by the Spirit in the holy sacrifice of the Mass to receive that slice of heaven on earth, to receive the resurrected body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. Last thought, I, I have misstated this on occasion, I had to kind of retract it, you know, but when we speak of the church as the, when we speak of the church as Catholic, what we don't mean is global, planetary, international. You know, that's what David's kingdom aspired to be. Catholic means universal. And so where is the church in her essential perfection in heaven? Jesus, Mary, Joseph, the saints, the angels, the martyrs. We're not another denomination besides them. We're the church militant. We're a pilgrim church. They're the church in triumph and glory. So we're united in the spirit. We believe in one Holy Spirit, the one Holy Catholic Apostolic Church. But the Pope is the head of the church on earth, as St. Thomas Aquinas says, temporarily and only over the wayfarers. But it's not the body of the Pope, it's the body of Christ. And so when we speak of the head of the church, we really want to help people to see that Christ is the head of the church. And so we have to lift up our hearts and minds anyway just to get reality right. And I, and I think wow. that's what these books are designed to do. That is, that is a great way to summarize it, lifting up your hearts and minds to get reality right. It's the structure of reality, like Rob said in that in the interview with you. Uh, last question. Um, in one of your most famous books, written with Mrs. Kimberly Hahn, Rome Sweet Home, right. uh, you end that book with talking about your hope together of forming 
scriptural Catholics, and you have the St. Paul Center, which is all about the Holy Scripture. So the question is, what is the importance of reading the Holy Scripture in exile, especially with other Catholics? Yeah, I mean, I can't possibly overstate the value, the importance, and the power because studying sacred scripture, reading scripture, you know, little sidebar again, I still use the term Bible, biblical, Bible study, but I so greatly prefer scripture, sacred scripture, like we have sacred liturgy, sacred tradition, because it's not just a book that is meant to be read by everybody, although we hoped to invite people to read it no matter what their circumstances, but just like the Eucharist is the holy sacrament. Though. So likewise, scripture is holy. This is meant for the liturgy, so is that. You know, we know from accounts that when early believers were arrested and tortured, they were pressured to give up the whereabouts, not only of the Eucharist, but of sacred scripture. And so putting it back in the, in the liturgy is not like chaining the Bible again. No, what we'd want to do is to train people to read scripture from the heart of the church. Whether it's the gospel and the epistle, it's more scripture that was read in my own Bible church growing up. Likewise, when you're in the Novus Ordo and you're looking at the revised lectionary, a 400% increase in the Old Testament, but re seeing how the new is concealed in the old, seeing how the old is fulfilled by the new. The Old Testament for Jews is like a story in search of an ending. But the new, apart from the old, is theologically unintelligible. So the morality, the sacramentality, the sacred mysteries are all, and this is why I think it's significant that the New Testament writers never refer to the Old Testament as the Old Testament. They call it graphe, scripture. They call it the law and the prophets. They refer to it as divine oracles. So by the third and fourth century, that habit has been formed, but even Augustine warns against this because the New Testament, is what you get when you're reading the Law and the Prophets in a state of grace, with the power of the faith, in the church's tradition. The letter that kills isn't just the Torah, it is reading scripture in a strictly human way, apart from the grace of the Holy Spirit, apart from the power of faith, and apart from living tradition. So Augustine said, if you read the Sermon on the Mount and memorize the Beatitudes, but never in the, the spirit of the church, it will be the letter that kills you. And so that's like a solemn warning that we want to read scripture, but from the heart of the church, which is the Holy Spirit, who is the soul of the mystical body. And, you know, I, I'm giving you lots of things because that's just the way my brain is wired. But, you know, what Kimberly has done and what we try to do in Rome Sweet Home, we just celebrated the 30th anniversary of that book, you know, especially in the last chapter, which I think we called Calling Catholics to be Bible Christians and Vice Versa. You know, this is a sacred heirloom. This will really help us to understand ourselves. You know, Ronald Knox made the observation, actually it was Frank Sheed, that when you're beaten up by a book, it's hard to feel warm affection for it. So as Bible Christians targeted Catholics and weaponized the Bible, I understand why cradle Catholics are a little, you know, a, a little hesitant about diving into the book. Couldn't that make me a Protestant? No. <laughs> Yes. And that's what the St. Paul Center exists for. I mean, reading scripture from the heart of the church, biblical literacy for the laity, biblical fluency for the clergy and the educators, but really it gets back to reading scripture in the living tradition. And that brings up the importance of that uh, all of our listeners and viewers should join the Emmaus Academy. Yes. So $25 a month, it's a steal. You get all sorts of programming um, from scholars in the scripture and all sorts of things about the Catholic faith. So Emmaus Academy, so you can click the link below, and you can also purchase these two books, It Is Right and Just and Catholic's Exile. If you want to join our Bible reading group, you can go to meaningofcatholic.com slash register. So let's offer this up in our time of exile. Let's let's pray the uh, let's pray the Salve Regina, because uh, it mentions exile. Perfect. The uh, name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail, Holy Queen, Queen Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn them, most gracious Advocate, thine eyes of mercy toward us. And after this our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O Clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. That we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus is King.
Amen.